Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. I want you to understand that there is a tendency always when you have been saved for a period of time that you can become stagnant in your faith. And as you can understand that this pool here that's all green is a stagnant pool partly because there's probably not an inlet or an outlet to that lake or to that pond. It's probably lukewarm. It's not hot. Bacteria will die if it's real hot. It's not cold. Bacteria doesn't grow well when it's cold. But when you have that pool, the basic meaning of stagnation, according to Wikipedia, is water that's not moving. And of course, when we look at our own Christian life, of course we're moving. <laughs> this last week, I was moving. We had that time up in Duluth, then we went to Hayward, Wisconsin. We drove back on the motorcycle, got in the car, drove to, to Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, tore out a concrete wall, put an egress window in it, fixed a, a car, painted an eave. We did a lot of work there in just a couple days. Put a drill bit through my hand. Really a lot of fun. Um, and swung that sledgehammer about 200 times. Of course I was moving. But you understand that, sure, the pond is moving. The pond is moving. You can't say the pond's not moving. The earth is revolving about 1,000 miles an hour. It's rotating around the sun at about 67,000 miles an hour. The pond is moving. It's just not moving at the surface. You understand that just because you're moving, just because you're busy physically, does not mean you're moving, that the Holy Spirit is moving within you. That there's any movement inside of your, your soul or your spirit. Of course, when you get to the Word of God, this is food for the Spirit. Don't you love music like that? To me, it's just like having food for the soul, and I just drink that up. I love to listen to that music because it just kind of feeds my soul. I love that. But if you've been saved for any period of time, it's hard to tell the difference between physical growth and spiritual growth. Physical growth is not the same thing as spiritual growth. Just because a church is growing numerically does not mean it's growing spiritually. Just because you are growing physically does not mean you're growing spiritually. Spiritual growth is very, very different. The Holy Spirit is trying to move us spiritually, but because He's pulling and pushing, there is much resistance that takes place. The object doesn't move, and if it doesn't move, it stagnates. So we're going to look today at just a short time at how do you know if you're really growing? How do you know if you have not stagnated in your Christian life? How do you know if you're growing? Well, the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1 is giving us some really important thoughts here in this chapter to help us to determine whether we are really growing in our Christian life or whether we have stagnated, whether we have been living on past victories, whether we are not moving, whether we are secure and stable and satisfied with where we are. Let's have a word of prayer as we get started this morning. Father, I thank you very much for the book of Colossians. Thank you for some of the portions of this book in this first chapter that give us a little bit of an indication, a gauge to see whether we have stagnated, whether we are still growing, whether we're still moving, whether the Holy Spirit can move us. And I pray, Father, that as we look at this, this test might really help us to see some things that we need to change in our life to become more like you. Father, once again, we're grateful for those who are here. We're thankful for the time we have together, for the baptism that's to follow. We just pray, Lord, that you might bless your word this morning. In your name we pray, amen. We said two weeks ago, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. We're just asking the question, who am I? Who, who are we in Christ? 
course, we talked about an apostle as a sent one, a sent one of Jesus Christ, one who's come to do the will of God, and of course, having the right relationships, having the right associations. Today, I want to just share with you, starting in verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to share with you, first of all, the most critical matter to determine whether you are truly growing. One, of the, one critical matter is, are you faithful? And we want to be like Christ. And Christ, Jesus Christ, is faithful. He is a faithful creator. God has new mercies every morning. Great is his faithfulness. For us to become like God, to become God-like, is to become more and more faithful. Faithfulness really has to do with stewardship. Faithfulness really has to do with the fact that God has given us abilities, talents, that he expects us to use for his glory, not our glory. He has given us things, material possessions, physical needs of our body, and he expects us to use it for his glory. The house that you have is not your house. Not from God's perspective. He has given it to you to use for His glory. You are a steward. The car that you drive, I know you make the payments on it, I know you work for it, but it's really not your car. Every single thing that's been entrusted to you on this earth has been entrusted to you by a God who has created all things and has given them to you for your use for His glory. And so if a person calls you up and says, I need a place to stay. And you ask God, God, would you have me share your house with them? It's not my house, it's your house. I'm a steward of what you have given me. Would you like me to share this house with them? And God says, yes, it's my possession. I'm letting you use it, but it's my house. And these people need a place to stay. Would you let them use my house? Lord, these people need a car. I have a car that I don't need to use today. And God says, well, it's not your car. It's my car. I'm letting you use it. But if you are to be faithful to me, you will use it for my glory. If there's a need, someone has a greater need than you have, yes, by all means, share it with them. This is what it's all about, the definition of a steward. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. God wants all of his saints to be faithful. And friends, it has a lot to do with what you have is based, dependent upon how you use it. If you use it for God's glory, God will give you more. If you do not use it for God's glory, God says, why should I give you more when you're not faithful in the least? If you're not faithful in the least, why would I give you much? I'm not giving this to you for you to hoard. I'm giving this to you for you to be faithful as a steward, to be faithful in the least amount, then I can give you much so that you can be faithful in much. And friends, frankly, This is not something we practice well as a church of Jesus Christ. We are really strong into ownership. It's our name on the line. We have the ones that have have responsibility to this possession. And we don't comprehend just what it means that God owns all things in our life. And if there's someone who has a greater need than I have, And God says to us, by the moving of the Holy Spirit within us, share that with them. We are wrong if we don't share it. The more we're given, the more accountable accountable we become. And again it says, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, much is required. Therefore, if you feel you have a great accountability to God, then obviously you feel that God has blessed you with much. If you feel you have a very small accountability with God, 
then obviously you think that God hasn't given you much. I don't have much accountability to Him because He hasn't given me much. The more we have, the more accountable we become. If you sense that accountability, then we have an issue. Now again, a growing Christian is one who is learning to give what he has been given. A stagnant Christian is one who holds on to what he has. Now listen, that's the definition I gave you of a pond. No outlet. There's no giving here. It comes to me, I take it, I hoard it, I don't give it out. There's no outlet here. I have the gospel, I don't share it with anyone. No outlet. It's all about me. I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, great. That's the definition of stagnation if we hold on and we don't give it out. Would you agree? I think I've lost some of you already. Let's try it again. The second point, do you have faith in Christ? Now, faith in Christ, it says, we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we've heard of your faith in Jesus Christ. Again, that's one of the tests to determine whether you're growing. Now, please understand that faith is pissed, this faithful is pissed off. They're very, very similar. One is like the inlet, one is like the outlet. Faith comes into my heart, I give it out by being faithful to God. Faithful by definition, that is one who is trusty or one who you can put faith in. So faithful and faith are very closely connected in this passage. Again, if you want to be like your dad, you will change into your image. If you want to be like your mom, you'll change into her image. If you want to be like God, you change into His image. It has an awful lot to do with your desire to be like God then. Do you really want to be godly? Do you want to change into His image? We all with open face beholding as in a glory, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, and in other words, a mirror, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Once again, faith is the inlet, faithful is the outlet. Is there a desire in you, in your life, to become more godly? If you've gotten to a point in your life that where you say, what's the point? I like what I have, I like who I am, I don't need to change. I'm just satisfied. I'm satisfied with my life. I'm satisfied with going to church. I'm satisfied with reading a chapter a day in the Bible. I'm satisfied with praying before I eat. I am just what I want to become. Change is very important when you're talking about the moving of the Spirit of God within you. You are changed into His image from glory to glory. That's the moving of the Spirit of God. Number three, how do you know if you're growing? How do you know if you're stagnating as a Christian? In your life in the last... Friends, I want to share with you, this with you. <laughs> I, I don't really need to preach to you today. I look at this message, and this message just really hurts inside of me. Because I know there have been times in my life when I've had a much greater passion... And it ebbs and flows. And I don't like when my passion gets less for God. I don't like when it ebbs and flows. I don't like when I get really excited about a passage of Scripture, then the next week I'm not excited. I don't want to be stagnated. Here's what it says here. Since we heard of your faith in Christ and the love which you have to all the saints... And so one of the points then for whether you're really growing is, is your love increasing? Again, you look at this passage that Jesus talks about, Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. Take your Bible, please, and turn with me to that passage. Matthew chapter 5, verse 46, please. He says in verse 42, Give to him that asks you, and from him that would borrow from you, do not turn away. You've heard that it hath been said, you'll love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you, persecute, persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is heaven, that you may be like Him, in other words. For He makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. 
He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the publicans the same? In other words, the publicans, the worst sinners of that time, do they love their friends? Do they care about their friends? Well, the Bible passage is saying, yes, they do. And as Christians, we tend to pinpoint those that we want to share our love with, but there are other people that we do not see as being lovely or lovable, and we don't want to really do, deal with them. The church in Colossae was different because they had a love for all of the saints. It was not inclusive or not exclusive of other people. It was not exclusive and just inclusive of this group. It was opened up to everyone that God loved. We're not talking about loving people when we talk about separation. We're not saying you're not to love certain people. The way God loves people, He loves the, the unjust and the just. And God expects us to love our enemies. He expects that. Now again, if you have a church that you say, well, they really didn't fit in pastor. It was probably good that they left this church. Friends, this is a huge issue in church today. People come to church for six months to six years and the people in the church have no idea who they are. It does not matter to them if they come. They have their friends. They have their little clique that they enjoy. And of course, of course, you see that in junior high and senior high. You see a lot of cliques where they exclude that person because they don't fit into the clique. And you're my friend as long as you don't like them. But unfortunately, it is the same when it comes to the adults in church. We do not notice new people. We do not care whether they're new people because we've got enough friends, we've got enough community already. So when God sends us new people, we don't know their names, we don't know what they're, what's going on in their life, we don't become involved with them or they're in their life. And God says to us, he that is faithful in that which is least. In other words, I'm not going to give you anyone new. If you cannot care for the ones I've already sent to you, why should I send you anyone else? Again, this is one of the huge, huge issues with a pastor. I've mentioned to you before, people come up and say, Pastor, I've got all these people on my Sunday school list. Can we cross them off? They don't come anymore. <laughs> no, we don't cross them off. Those are people that God sent our way that were part of this church that we want to care about. We want to reach out and find out, why aren't you coming? We want you to be a part of our community. We want you to be a part of our fellowship. We want to love all of you. And again, that's difficult. I know that's difficult. But having said that, again, God expects faith and love to continue to grow. He wants us to care for more and more people. The more people we care for, the more capacity God gives us to love. The more people we love, the more capacity God gives us to love. The less people we love, the less capacity God gives us to love. And again, listen to this. The Lord make you to increase and abound in love. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. And we beseech you, brethren, you increase more and more and more and more. He is saying, I know you love these people. I want you to increase more and more. This I pray that your love may, may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all discernment in the book of Philippians. Paul has a tremendous desire that our love increases. How do you know if you are truly growing? Is your love increasing? Do you have a greater love than you had in the past? Number four, do you produce good fruit? Good fruit. Somewhere there is one. I don't know. <laughs> can't find it. It's there somewhere. I just can't see it. Um, there's a blue, red, blue light there. There it is. I see it. Okay. Anyway, I lost the red light. 
The, third, the fourth thing then is, do you produce good fruit? For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before the word of the truth, the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and brings forth fruit, as it does also in you, since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God and truth. God expects us to produce fruit. Now listen, you can go out to Sargent's Nursery, and again, you would, this would never happen at Sargent's Nursery, I understand that, but you buy a tree, and you buy a tree there, and it, you pay a lot of money. And you take that tree home, and it is a great-looking tree. You take it, and you dig a hole, you put it in the ground, you put good soil, you soak it, you make sure there's no air around it, you put it in there, you put fertilizer on it, you water it every day, and it grows and grows and produces this fruit that is so yucky. It is small, it is bitter, it tastes terrible. And you go back to the nursery and say, hey, this apple tree I bought from you does not produce good apples. You can't eat them. And they say, no, it's a very expensive tree. It produces good apples. No, I don't care how much it costs. You don't determine whether it's a good tree by how much it costs. You determine whether it's a good tree by whether it produces good fruit. It has nothing to do with what its family history is. It doesn't have anything to do with what its job is. I don't care whether you've been in church for 45, 50 years. I don't care whether you've been a deacon. I don't care whether you've tithed for the last 45, 50 years. The issue is, if you have good fruit, you are a good tree. If you have bad fruit, you have ba a bad tree. It's simple. The Bible is very clear. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. If you have good fruit, you're a good tree. If you have evil fruit, you're an evil tree. It doesn't have, have anything to do with whether you smile on Sunday morning. The point is this. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. So if you sow a certain type of, of seed, you will reap a certain type of crop. Now, the definition of corrupt fruit, this is the next verse. For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And again, I have people that I deal with that, Pastor, my mom and dad do not care about me. They don't like me. They think I have done something so wicked. I, yes, I am living with a man and I have a baby and I'm not married. But what is that? They don't even treat me as, as if I exist. Okay. You talk to that person, they say, Pastor, we love each other. The dilemma is this. The dilemma is this. If it is of the flesh, it is corrupt. If it's of the Spirit of God, it is life everlasting. How do you determine whether what this person is doing is good or bad? It's not based upon whether the parents are good or bad. It's not based upon whether they can justify it. It's not based even whether they love each other. It is based upon whether they're doing right before God. And it doesn't matter what they're saying. Yes, we love each other. Love does not make it right. It's wrong. If it's of the flesh, it's, it's corrupt. Again, we go back to Galatians 6, 7. And you say, okay, but pastor, I come to church. I, I teach Sunday school. I'm a deacon. Yes, I am. That's great. I love it. I'm a pastor of a church. That's great. I've been a pastor for 32 years. That's great. Wonderful. What is in your heart? Well, you know what's in my heart. You see that? No, I don't know what's in your heart. How do you know what's in your heart? <laughs> well, when you go to work and your boss gets upset with you because of some real sloppy work that you did and he yells at you <laughs> and all of a sudden the pressure is on you and you take the sponge and you squeeze it, anybody can take a dirty sponge and rinse it in clean water and let the clean water run off it. But if you squeeze it, you can see what's in the middle of the sponge. 
The outside has nothing to do with what's in the middle of the sponge, and you're not going to find out what's in the middle of the sponge unless you squeeze it. When you squeeze it hard, you will find out what's in the middle of the sponge, right? So whether you're going to find out what your, your fruit is like is not based upon what the pastor says to you or what your friend says to you in church. There's no pressure there. It's when the guy cuts you off in traffic that you find out what's in the heart. <laughs> when the pressure comes, right? What happens is when you go to work and you're falsely accused and the pressure comes and you get squeezed, then you know what's in the sponge. Then you can tell. Again, pressure is what reveals that. Now, why does God allow you to have pressure in your life? So you can see what's in the sponge. God wants there to be pressure in your life because He wants you to be godly. He doesn't want you to have junk in your heart and a smile on your face. Come to church with a smile on your face, great. That does not mean that's not what's in your heart. This will be the last point, and then we'll get to our baptism. But I just want you to know, I know this is, sounds really redundant, but a growing Christian keeps growing. Are you growing? In other words, this. Was there ever a time that you desired the Word of God more than you desire it now? Is there a real hunger in your heart for the Word of God? I've got folks in church that desire God's word and I can tell it by looking at their face they love to come to church to hear the word of God but then I have other people who come to church and they have no desire whatsoever to hear the word of God and you can see it on their face they went to Bible college or they went to a good church they heard and they learned and they had some great times in the past they know a lot about the Bible great and it's all based upon what took place in the past because there's no hunger anymore. Hunger's not there. My mom used to say to me, don't eat those potato chips, they'll ruin your appetite. <laughs> How do you ruin your appetite? Well, you go to the dinner table and she puts this pork chop on your plate with these green beans. And you take a bite of pork chop and it's okay, but mom, I'm not really hungry. Oh. You didn't even touch your beans. I don't feel like beans. You ruined your appetite. <laughs> the potato chips. The problem with ruining your appetite is not that you eat food in advance. That's not the point. The problem is you eat Fritos or Doritos or potato chips. That's not necessarily good for you. And when the good food comes, you're not hungry. Make sense? Again, a growing Christian... You don't want to ruin your appetite. You want to be hungering and hungering and hungering for the Word of God. Desiring it. Do you agree? So I'm just giving you some points again. You look at this pond, and the pond has no inlet, no outlet. It's lukewarm. It's stagnated. Life in the pond. There is life in the pond. Fish in the pond, yes, I understand that. You don't want to drink it. You don't want to drink it. You don't want it to give it to anyone else. I don't want to be stagnated. I want to continue to grow. I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, and that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.